My brothers and sisters in Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, dear brothers and sisters, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We are coming to the close of our Easter season. Uh, we're already in the sixth week of Easter, and our attention today, I want to focus on our epistle lesson from the book of Acts, or our first reading, I should say, from the book of Acts. And we see Paul speaking with the pagan Greek culture in Athens, in the Areopagus. And there is a tremendous lesson for us in the way that he communicates with the people of his day, because the way that he communicates with them is going to look a lot like how we're going to communicate with the people in today's world. So imagine yourself being thrust into a culture that's not your own. You don't know the language, you don't know the customs, and you have to find a way to communicate and communicate effectively. Now, of course, I could be talking about the history of the United States, that is, our nation's history right down to the present day, and whether our ancestors have been here for a long time or whether they've come relatively recently, all of us who are in America share a story where our ancestors came over from another country to a land that was foreign to them with very few resources to start a new life, to forge a new future. And our literary, uh, our literary body, our literary history is also full of allusions to that same, type of, that same type of trope, that same type of comparison, where the hero of the story wakes up to find themselves in a strange land and they have to find a whole new way of communicating and a whole new way of getting along. So of course we all know Alice in Wonderland as Alice falls through the rabbit hole into, into a Wonderland, interacting really in a nonsensical fashion with all of the denizens of that, of that world. Or we have Gulliver's Travels, which chronicles the adventures of Gulliver as he sails to many different cultures throughout the world, um, exotic places. Most famously, he lands in Lilliput, where he encounters a group of people who are you know, six inches or so tall, called the Lilliputians, and he has to learn to communicate with them. Or you have the Wizard of Oz in the, as well, where Dorothy lands in, in the land of Oz, and she has that famous statement to her, to her dog, Toto, I, th I have the feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And on and on, we have that same, that same genre of literature and movie uh, that is before us, whether we're talking about the Chronicles of Narnia or the Matrix. It's a very common theme in literature and in film. And for those who don't know, Scripture uses that same trope of strangers in a strange land when it talks about us, when it talks about believers. It often refers to us as sojourners and exiles. And just a couple of examples of that. All the way back in Genesis, when, jo when Jacob goes down to Egypt after his son Joseph brings the whole family down to Egypt to live with him during the famine, Jacob is talking to Pharaoh, and he says, the days of, of the years of my sojourning are 130, and they have not attained the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. Speaking of the Old Testament faithful, the author of Hebrews, again, uses very similar language. The author of Hebrews writes, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. And Peter, in his first letter, from which our epistle lesson today comes, begins his first epistle with Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So over and over and over again, the Word of God describes the faithful people of God in similar terms because our home is not here. Our home is kept for us in heaven. Our inheritance, again, to use Peter's words, um, is kept in heaven where it doesn't perish, spoil, or fade. And how we act and what we value and how we speak in this world isn't anything like what the world values, isn't anything like how the world speaks, isn't any way like the world acts. We are indeed 
strangers in a strange land. And nowhere do we see that probably more prominently than in our first reading from Acts 17, where Paul goes to Athens to preach the gospel. Now Luke writes in setting the stage in Athens, he says, Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling and hearing something new. So there was great curiosity in Athens. So as we all know from our history classes, the, the Greeks and especially the Athenians were known for their love of philosophy and debate. And so this is what they spent their time doing. And Paul knew that their curiosity, that their intellectual curiosity and had a healthy dose of religion that was mixed in with it. And so Luke reports that while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So here's Paul in Athens recognizing that the people around him may not know God, may not know the God of the Bible, but they were intensely religious. They were looking for something and they just didn't know what they were looking for. And so Paul takes the opportunity to preach, to go to the Areopagus, which is the marketplace where debate and public discourse happened, and he presented the gospel. And like Alice and like Gulliver and all of the other, all of the other uh, characters that we know from literature uh, who found themselves in a strange new world, Paul found himself in a strange world where he wasn't immediately accepted either. And so after hearing Paul speak, many of the Athenians gathered around and said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. And that is the message of the gospel, whether it is in Paul's time or especially as we get into the, as we continue in to the 21st century in America. Many of us in the church are waking up to the new reality that we aren't in Kansas anymore. We are, in fact, aliens in our own world, and we continue to bring strange things or strange words to the ears of the world today. 20 or 30 years ago, the Western world was a pretty familiar place for most Christians. Most of us felt pretty comfortable in the marketplace. Most of us felt pretty comfortable in society. And that's because society still held a roughly Judeo-Christian shell to it. Workplaces had Christmas parties. They weren't holiday parties. Uh, many places still had Easter Monday off. Who in our world today even knows what Easter Monday is? Other than being a recollection in Christians' memories, who in the world knows that there even is an Easter Monday? Our value system at the time, again, was broadly Judeo-Christian. Marriage was exclusively between a man and a woman. Gender wasn't confused. Children were born usually into a married household. And all of that, all of that has changed. And so when we speak about the way things were or about the way things should be according to God's word, we get a reaction like the Athenians gave to Paul. You bring strange things to our ears. People haven't heard this before. And yet, rather than grieve about what no longer exists, or rather than get angry at people for their lack of understanding or their quote-unquote ignorance to what the, God, the word of God says, Paul presents an example for us of how to speak to a world that doesn't speak Christianese. And so he starts by establishing common ground with the Athenians, taking the Athenians where they were at, rather than, being, rather than chastising them for not being like him, he establishes common ground and says, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Now many people in our world, and our, even in our culture, even in America, don't know the first thing about Christianity, just as the Athenians didn't know the first thing about Christianity when Paul first visited. And we can't expect, as members of the church, that the lifestyle, the value system, or the language of people who are outside the church are going to look 
at all like our lifestyle or going to sound like our language. And then through conversation, Paul begins to open the door. He doesn't belittle the Athenians for where they've been, but rather his conversation opens the door to invite more conversation. He goes on. He says, For as I passed along and I observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And so Paul used what was available to him to open a door to continue this conversation and this proclamation of the gospel. Well, the conversations that we have with people in our day who are unfamiliar with what we believe and what we teach, are those conversations going to be uncomfortable? Yes, they are. Are we going to hear things, be told things that are uncomfortable, that offend our Christian sensibilities, that conflict with what we, with what we know to be right from the Word of God? Of course they are. But once again, we are strangers in a strange land. And the people with whom we speak find our value systems and our language just as foreign to them as we find their value system and their language is to us. It's no different. We're both speaking past one another. And so our Lord didn't hang out with the religious people of his day. Our Lord made a, criticized, in fact, the religious authorities, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, for their inability to accept people who are unlike themselves. So rather than hang out with the people who thought they already knew God, who spoke like Jesus, who would have known the scripture like Jesus, our Lord spent time with the quote-unquote sinners and tax collectors. He made a way for those who didn't know God. And we now have an opportunity to speak to the world in a way that we haven't had for many years. And all of this comes because of the coronavirus. Google Trends measures what people are searching for by the, by the words they put in the search bar. And since coronavirus broke out, the search word prayer is at an all-time high. It's never been higher since Google started measuring its analytics than it is right now. The world, like Athens, is religious. They just don't know for who. They just don't know what they're searching for, but they are religiously hungry. And we have an opportunity to say, just like Paul, what you worship as unknown, this I now proclaim to you. The world is hungry, and it may be ignorant of what they're, of what they're looking for, but they are hungry for hope. And we have that hope. We are the ones with the hope that the world needs. That's what Peter tells us in our epistle lesson from today. He says, In your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord, Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that lies within you. Yet do it with gentleness and do it with respect. The same way that Paul approached the Athenians is exactly what Peter is saying. The same way our Lord approached sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes in, during his ministry is the same way that we reach out to the world today in an open-handed fashion, knowing that what they say and what they do is not going to be what we say or do, but yet we have hope for them, just as, they have, just as our Lord has given hope to everyone. Dearly beloved in the Lord, what Satan would use for evil through this virus, God will use for good, to open the hearts and minds of people who are searching for hope in the midst of crisis. We have the message of the free forgiveness of sins through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And, that has, and his life, death, and resurrection has opened the doors of heaven for all who believe. My brothers and sisters, let us use this opportunity to proclaim the gospel to people like our neighbors or our friends or our family members who may never have heard it before or who may never have been open to the message before that they may also receive an inheritance that is kept for them in heaven that will not perish, spoil, or fade, but is kept through the blood of Christ, which we await for the day when he returns. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit 
be with you all. Amen.